Good afternoon, and thanks for tuning in to Politics and the Pulpit here on your hometown station. This is your holy host back for another opportunity to bring clarity to a world that embraces cloudiness and confusion. At the bottom of the hour today, we'll be joined online with the real Deborah Polly, and we'll talk about the $450 plus million dollar bond that President Trump may not be able to post by next Monday. And we're going to also talk about what I believe is the slow conservative drift occurring here in the golden state of California. And by the way, I'm excited about that because uh, ever since March 5th, I have seen the votes uh, trickle in our favor, not in every race, but in a lot of races, especially uh, when it relates to uh, Proposition 1, which we'll talk about later. Uh, with Deborah Polly. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the enthusiasm gap. Um, last night, uh, we had primaries in several states, and uh, the numbers, frankly, just don't lie. Um, what's interesting is if you compare the numbers uh, that Trump won last night with to the numbers that Joe Biden won, uh, with the exception of Illinois, you see a pretty big enthusiasm gap. Let's start with the Ohio GOP Senate race, where uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, we saw a pretty tight race between uh, Marino, Dolan, and LaRose. And uh, it wasn't uh, just, what was it, four or five days ago that President Trump came into Ohio, uh, gave a big speech and a rally for Marino, and uh, yesterday, uh, he ends up winning with uh, over 50% of the vote. And, of course, that, by the way, that uh, big uh, rally last Saturday was the one with the, quote, bloodbath comment that the, media, uh, that the uh, mainstream media keeps lying about and running with and cutting and pasting portions of what they want and what they don't want in that speech. But nevertheless, uh, Marino came out of nowhere and um, got 553, 674 votes which again is 50.5% of the votes to Dolan's 32.9% of the vote, and LaRose, uh, who had 16.6% uh, of the vote. And by the way, uh, I believe that Marino is going to need Dolan's votes and LaRose's votes, uh, votes, and I'm sure that they're all going to come home to Marino because the ultimate objective is to get rid of Sherrod Brown. And Ohio has been trending right ever since 2016. I know this is interesting, but Ohio... And um, Iowa were both won by Barack Obama in 2009 and 2012 easily, handily. And technically, the, those two states were wild cards. They could have went either way. But ever since 2016, when Trump won, uh, ran the first time, those two states now are solidly in the conservative Republican red corner. So... Hopefully, Dan Marino is going to successfully unseat Sherrod Brown there in a very GOP-friendly Ohio. And then when it comes to the Trump vote in Ohio, uh, Trump got 80% of the vote and got 900,000-plus votes in a primary. Again, I know this is a primary, that primaries don't necessarily... Uh, mean that this is the same enthusiasm that's going into a national election. But if you have this much enthusiasm in a primary, something tells me that the enthusiasm is not going to wane, but increase going into November. Uh, Haley, by the way, who dropped out a couple weeks ago, uh, ended up with about 14% of the vote there in Ohio. Now, let's compare that to <laughs> President Joe Biden who got 456,523 votes, or if you will, 87.1% uh, of the Democratic vote there uh, against Dean Phillips, who actually got a pretty sizable chunk, 67,800, uh, 67, votes for about 13% of the share, which frankly is not that bad uh, for a guy that's been out of the race now for almost two weeks. Uh, but if you just look at the deficit between uh, Biden and former President Trump, we're talking like about a 400,000 vote deficit, folks. Uh, let's go over to Illinois, 
Illinois is a reliably blue state. Illinois uh, is, of course, the state uh, with the, with Chicago. All that you know how how blue Chicago is. Um, Illinois, uh, Trump got four hundred and seventy four thousand six hundred and sixteen votes, or eighty percent of the total share of the Republican vote, and uh, Biden got six hundred and eighty four thousand. Now you say, well, there's about one hundred and eighty thousand vote difference there between Biden and Trump. Yeah, but why didn't Biden get more than 600,000? I mean, Illinois is a reliably blue, some would argue deep blue state. But you know that Illinois is actually maybe in play. I know that's a bit of a far fetch right there. Maybe I should rephrase that. Maybe it could be in play another few years down the road. But it's not as deep blue this cycle as it was in 2016 or in 2020. Biden is only winning the state of Illinois right now against against Trump by about seven or eight percentage points, which frankly is not that great, especially in light of the fact that the governor, Governor Pritzker, is a uh, you know a far left progressive, and then of course Chicago uh, is a far left uh, city with a socialist uh, mayor that was just put in there about a year ago. Uh, let's continue here. Let's look at Kansas. Kansas. Uh, Trump ended up with 70,000 and some change, or 75% of the Republican vote, whereas compared to Biden, he got 35,000 votes, folks. Now, again, I know Sunflower State, reliably conservative, but this is also the same state uh, that about a little over a year ago uh, passed a pro-death abortion platform. I wonder where all those votes went to. Uh, what about uh, Arizona? Arizona, of course, is one of those states that uh, Trump is hoping to flip during this cycle. Uh, obviously, he won it in 2016, barely. Uh, lost it, again, barely, uh, by an even smaller margin uh, to Biden in 2020, or so they say. And uh, I looked at uh, Trump's take from yesterday. Trump got 451,000 and 77% of the vote there, whereas Biden got 353,000. What does that tell you? It tells you the enthusiasm in a place like Arizona, a reliably swing state, is just not there for President Joe Biden. In fact, uh, Marianne Williamson, who uh, is kind of in, kind of out, running for the Democratic side uh, as some sort of competition for Joe Biden, ended up with 13,000 votes which is you know, pretty decent, I guess. And then, of course, you've got Florida. Uh, there was no primary for the Democrats, but uh, in Florida, Trump got 81% of the total vote, and uh, he got just under 1 million votes in the Republican primary. He won every county in Florida. Trump won every county in Arizona. Trump won every county in Ohio and he won just about every county in the state of Illinois. And then, you compare those numbers to 2020, the enthusiasm is far greater than it ever was. Folks, I'm hoping, I'm praying, that that translates to a decisive general election victory. Listen, if it's close, they can cheat. But if it's not close, they can't cheat. And we want to make sure that we're not winning these states by, you know, 0.08% or a percent. We want to win these states by 3, 4, and 5% margins. Why? Because if it's not close, they can't cheat. There was also a race here in the state of California which I'm going to turn my attention ever so slightly here uh, to our uh, home state here. And um, California U.S. House District 20 uh, held a special election primary yesterday. Uh, this is to fill um, Kevin McCarthy's seat, who, of course, is going to be uh, leaving office here very soon. Uh, but the competitor going into yesterday was Vince Fong, and I looked at the numbers last night uh, when the early – returns came in, and Mike Boudreau, uh, who is also a Republican, 
um, was actually leading, but then it started to flip right around, oh, 10, 30, 11 o'clock last night. And then Vince Fong ended up, uh, it looks as if he actually took this last night against um, uh, Mike Boudreaux. Now, this means that we'll have a Republican uh, that we're going to be able to vote for in November. Actually, two Republicans, either Vince Fong or Mike Boudreaux. Marissa Wood, the Democrat, uh, is actually licking at the heels of Mike Boudreaux for that second place spot. And of course, you know, here in California, it's a jungle primary, so top two finishers uh, go into uh, the general election. Uh, I'm not too certain about this particular race. Maybe this is decisive here for last night, but um, maybe somebody can give me a quick text and let me know. But I do think the top two finishers go into November. And if that is the case, we have two Republicans to choose from to replace a Republican, which I think. It is a great thing. And folks, all i got to tell you is um, I do believe that there is a bit of a shift happening here in the state of California. And uh, when uh, Deborah Polly calls in a little bit later, I want to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, in fact, uh, I'll just highlight something very briefly. Uh, there's a Red State article that was just put out not too long ago. I think it was Monday, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Jennifer Connolly wrote it. And um, it talks about how the four races here in the northern part of Los Angeles County could be the canary in the coal mine heading into November's general election. Now, of those four, one has already been won outright, and that would be Catherine Barger's position as superintendent. There's only one Republican uh, on the supervisor uh, seats, and that would be Catherine Barger. However, she won her seat uh, with 50 plus one. I think she's at 55 and some change at the moment. Uh, even with another 150,000 votes or so outstanding. Uh, but uh, Catherine Barger is going to go uh, with, without having any kind of uh, any kind of race going in November. She's won this, uh, her, her next uh, term, without any problem. So that's, let's strike her out, not a problem. But the other seats, that might be the canary in the coal mine, if you will, for the general elections, and something that bodes negatively for Democrats here in California, uh, would be the seat held here in our 27th Congressional District by Congressman Mike Garcia, uh, who won against George Whitesides in the primary uh, by over 15, 16 percentage points. And he expanded on his win in the primary from, against uh, Christy Smith in 2020. So obviously he's, he's gaining, if you will, or 2022, excuse me. And so uh, Mike Garcia just seems to be gaining uh, at more and more and more steam, whereas George Whitesides, uh, by the way, I've reached out to, to the Whiteside uh, campaign. Uh, they have not responded at all to any of my uh, uh, my questions to have them come and join the show. Uh, I want to know exactly what George Whitesides would do. Um, many of you, you know, live here in our fair city here of Santa Clarita, and uh, I do most of my ministry, and uh, my dealings are right here in Santa Clarita. I've lived here for many years myself. Um, don't you think um, Santa Clarita looks different from some parts of the San Fernando Valley? And don't you think there's a reason for that? And what exactly would George Whitesides implement or do to keep Santa Clarita looking the way it does? I'd, I'd love for George or for one of his campaign lackeys to come on and explain to me exactly what George would do that is so drastically different from what Mike is doing or from what Buck McKeon did years ago in order to keep this bastion of Santa Clarita uh, what a lot of people are aspiring to move to when they leave the asphalt jungle of Los Angeles proper. If you can't tell the difference between our fair city and Los Angeles proper, I don't know what to say to you. And if you can't tell a difference from just over the hill in parts of the San Fernando Valley to Santa Clarita, then I don't know what to say. So seriously, what is George Whitesides going to do that Mike Garcia isn't only just doing, but doing very well? So if any of you out there know uh, anything about the George Whitesides campaign or know any of the affiliates or contacts, please let me know because I would love to have any one of them, including George himself, to come on and defend uh, why he would be a better choice 
as opposed to Congressman Garcia. And then you've got Pilar Chavo, who is uh, sitting in the seat, uh, State Assembly, uh, that uh, former Suzette Valadares used to have. And she won a squeaker of an election uh, just a couple of years ago. And um, we've got a Republican contender against her uh, by the name of Patrick Lee Gibson, who we just had on the show a week ago. And he, he did pretty well in the primary. I think Pilar is only ahead by a hair right now. And that's after two weeks of counting. She's just barely ahead. And so it's very possible that Patrick could flip that back to the R side in November. Then we've got Suzette Valadares' seat, uh, or I should say Scott Wilkes' seat, uh, that Suzette is vying for. Uh, and that covers Palmdale, Lancaster, uh, parts of Santa Clarita, and then goes off into Victorville and portions of Apple Valley out there. It's a pretty big, pr pretty big seat, pretty big chunk. And there's a lot of open country out there, too. Uh, but she ended up winning a pretty decisive victory in the primary against Kip Mueller with another Republican challenger who ended up nipping at her heels with 21% of the vote. And Lord willing, those 21% are going to head over to Suzette's side when we get into the general election because we're going to need all hands on deck in order to make sure that Kip Mueller gets nowhere near that state Senate seat. Folks, and if you've seen any of Kip's commercials, you know, they appeal uh, to what I call the low information voter. Uh, the voter that doesn't, you know, doesn't go beyond the headlines or looks beyond the Twitter feed or, uh, you know, the quick Facebook post. Folks, you've got to read things. And Kip is a progressive leftist. And we do not want our district, our area represented by Democrats that want to destroy a basic way of life. And I would encourage all of you out there that are listening, be informed, get engaged, do your best with these candidates, and support them. When we come back here on Politics of the Pulpit, we'll be talking to Deborah Polly and some of the green shoots of conservatism here in California when we return on Politics and the Pulpit. Here on Politics and the Pulpit, good to have you back today. Um, we have on the line uh, Deborah Polly, and I want to set this up. Uh, Deborah Polly, of course, is no stranger to our show. She's been on uh, quite regularly in the past. She's very much involved in conservative politics in Orange County. And uh, according to her own Facebook post, she has a sharp legal mind, and she loves the taste of arugula. <laughs> is that right? You you love the taste of arugula. Fresh arugula. In spring is the time for arugula. Yes, it's terrific. You know, when I think of arugula, I think of like um, like kale that decorates a salad bar. That, you know, there's no comparison between arugula <laughs> and kale. Kale is just a bitter, horrible little thing. And I don't know how the, the health nuts have convinced so many people to eat it. But arugula is delightful with a light, peppery taste, and it just adds flavor to any salad or sandwich. Well, you know what? That, that will be our only disagreement today. And if that is the case, Deborah, I think we're on good standing. All right, so, so great to have you on today. So let me just get right into this. So next Monday, uh, in just five days, Trump is supposed to post his 450 plus million bond to the state of New York. I don't exactly know who in New York is going to get it, uh, but nevertheless, he's having trouble doing this. He's signaling that he may not be able to actually post bond. So if he doesn't, Letitia James has already said uh, that she's going to begin seizing his assets, which, by the way, according to what I've heard, includes assets that are outside of New York proper. So what are your thoughts on that, and can Trump's team use the Eighth Amendment here, or is that a moot point at this point? Cruel and unusual punishment? Is that what you're saying? Well, the, uh, the thing about the uh, unusual fines. Well, it is unusual. Yeah. I think that the thing that has to, we have to kind of lay the groundwork here is that where a, where a judgment requires the payment of money or a money judgment, and that judgment has already been levied against him, 
the judgment creditor, that is the party who won in the trial court, can usually enforce the judgment immediately. So they could enforce that judgment immediately. But if the losing party, Trump, uh, in this instance, determines to appeal the tri court, trial court's ruling or judgment, the appellant can stop enforcement by obtaining a bond from a surety company. This is pretty common. Um, this is to stay the enforcement of the money judgment during the pendency of the appeal. And, of course, Trump is, is appealing this. He has to appeal this. Uh, it's, only, it's the only reasonable thing to do. This gives assurances to the court that the appellee uh, and to the appellee that if the appellant does not prevail through the appeal process, which can take as long as two years, it is not unusual for an appeal to take two years, that the money judgment is not in jeopardy. In any way, they're putting it to the side somewhere. It's called an appeal bond. It's pretty common when we're talking about appealing a money judgment. But in most cases, the bond is for about one and a half times the amount of judgment. Uh, and when you're talking about this giant judgment the judgment was 363 dollars 363.8 million dollars which is disgorgement and pre-judgment interest for losing this civil uh, action that was brought by you know uh, wrongfully i believe brought by the ag so i believe it's, it's wrongful and he'll probably end up prevailing but in order to not have his uh, assets immediately seized he needs to put up this bond. The annual bond premium can be 1% to 2% of the amount of the bond. So in this case, with $454 million in penalties being levied, just think about that. Who, who actually would be able to produce a bond in that amount? Maybe a giant corporation, but not any one individual. And the penalties on those annual costs over the course of the appeal can really add up. We're probably talking about $20 million in nothing but just the interest that is going to be adding to that that a, a, a appeal. It doesn't stay the interest that's being accrued. Just because something is being appealed, it doesn't stay the interest that's being accrued. Uh, if the judgment debtor is financially secure, and I think most people would say that Donald Trump is financially secure, secure despite all the lawfare he's been enduring lately and other bonds that he's had to put up uh, pending appeal on other uh, lawsuits that he has supposedly lost. Uh, usually what happens is a prudent judgment creditor will waive the appeal bond in order to eliminate the possible liability on those premiums. We're probably talking about $20 million at least in premiums uh, that Trump would be paying. And a normal, let's say a, a person in a civil case, would say, well, I don't want to be liable for paying him $20 million if I lose on appeal, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to waive, you know, this, uh, this bond. But what are we talking about here? We're talking about the government. And if the government loses on appeal, who is going to be paying that $20 million plus in accrued interest that Trump will be, you know, will be um, – should be able to, to claim if he wants to. Who's going to be liable for that? Well, the reason why I, I brought up the Eighth Amendment earlier, uh, Deborah, is here, here's the exact amendment. It says, quote, excessive bail shall not be required nor excessive fines imposed. And I'm thinking this is about as excessive as it can be on an individual basis. I don't think there's been a fine uh, that's been imposed on an individual that's been quite as large as this one. And um, there isn't. in fact, there I would isn't. say the way the, the way Judge Erdogan has rationalized this is it's like telling a death row inmate, you can appeal this after you go on the after you go on the chair. <laughs> you know, you have to you have to actually be electrocuted before you can make the appeal. And so uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. In other words, in order for him to even challenge this, he has to post the bond. So it, it, to me, it doesn't make sense. But. Maybe to a legal mind like you it does, but I'm thinking this doesn't make sense to me. And it, to me it sounds like excessive bail and excessive fines imposed, and it's meant to be a shot across the bow to men like Trump. Well, in fact, his legal team has already um, appealed that to a mid-level state of appellate court. It's called an interlocutory appeal. Mm -hmm. It will not decide the case. 
itself or the or the cause for appeal, but only settle some intervening matter related to the case, and that uh, that would have, of course be the amount of this bond. His lawyers are asking that he be allowed to post a $100 million bond, which he can handle, yeah. uh, while he appeals the judgment that's been handed down. So I think I think a reasonable uh, court will grant that interlocutory appeal, and that will be the bond that he has to put up. Another option that he always has is to allow her to go ahead and uh, Leticia to go ahead and um, start seizing his assets. Seizing his assets. I, they don't have she, a, a state AG will not she will have quite a heavy lift outside of her own personal jurisdiction. She may be able to seal seal um, seize assets in New York, but it's really already hurt the New York uh, real estate market quite a bit. You know, though I'm not I'm not you know uh, a realtor, but most municipalities of any size really rely on their their real estate holdings. They rely on. Uh, property taxes that are, you know, a primary source of revenue. Yeah. And when you start monkeying with and messing with the market value of real estate because it's no longer a safe place for investors to put their money to invest in New York, you actually start tearing at the fabric of what you have available for the revenue to run your own city, to run your own state. So, I, I, you know, I, it's foolish. I know with all things Trump, we should probably stop using the term unprecedented but can you imagine, can you imagine on Monday, he's unable to post this bond, and Letitia James, who of course ran, uh, basically saying, you elect me and I'm going to get him in some way, some fashion, and she ends up, you know, doing that. And can you imagine, he, she starts to seize his assets. I wonder how that's going to look to the average voter out there. I mean, that, that is literally an unprecedented thing. Well, we've already seen every single time he's charged with another outrageous uh, crime, uh, you know, and civil. this is civil litigation. It's not even criminal litigation. You know, it's civil, a civil fine that's being levied. Every time it happens, every time someone comes forward with a false accusation or tries to, you know, indict him for some alleged crime, his poll numbers just go up. You know, even in, in California, he's sitting at, with Republicans anyway, 79 percent. But we're seeing massive increases in his uh, popularity among Hispanic vote and the black vote nationally, not just in California. So I think all it's doing is is hurting their cause. If they're trying to destroy him, they're doing just the opposite. But, you know, you and I both know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose did, and uh, is that is, is that the boring? real deborah polly quoting saint paul <laughs> <laughs> yes that's the real deborah polly quoting scripture absolutely that's something i do sometimes that's where true wisdom comes from amen and so we're just watching somebody just uh, and he's got he has got the uh, christians of uh, surrounding him in continual prayer i pray for his safety all the time absolutely and we all should be praying for his safety because think about what he's He's really putting himself out there, massive amounts of holdings that have been placed at risk simply because he wants to save our country and help it re recover to its once glorious place. Yeah. You just mentioned California, which is a great uh, opportunity for a segue right here. But let me, uh, let me set up this question. Uh, I got this story here from Chicago. Yesterday, they had a vote there in Chicago for a, a bill that was essentially – the same kind of a bill like we had here in California, supported by Gavin Newsom, that whole homeless vet bill. And Ch Chicago had something very much like that called Bring Chicago Home Referendum. And Chicago voters, Chicago voters, Deborah, voted this tax hike down, even though it wasn't promoted as a tax hike. And I have the latest poll numbers here of the state ballot measure for California on Prop 1. Quote, the bonds for mental health treatment facilities that Gavin Newsom spent over $25 million, uh, to pass. Right now, it is at 50.1% yes and 49.9% no. I think there are some green shoots of conservatism happening not only in our golden state, but maybe green shoots of conservatism in bastions of blue like Chicago. 
Absolutely. You know, when I saw the first set of numbers come through on Prop 1, and anybody who wants to look at those needs to go to the Secretary of State's website, not their local Registrar of Voters website. That won't give you the full picture. But you were quoting the full picture from, I believe, yesterday, close of business, and what we're looking at now, 50.2%. But there's been about 20,000 vote margin between the yes and the no, which is unheard of. Normally, every bond that I have seen and been watching as a statewide bond initiative has passed overwhelmingly. This has been really, really close. So close at one point, there was only 10,000 votes separating the yes versus the no. And when you're talking about, you know, uh, 8,000 voters, or excuse me, eight, excuse me, 8 million voters, when you're talking about 8 million votes, and only 10,000 separating the yes from the no, that really, I think you're right. There are people are starting to wake up, and they're seeing that bonds that don't mean free money. Somewhere along the line, you know, you're, you're paying for it. I like, I like to liken this to Charlie Brown. Remember every time Lucy puts the football down and says, go ahead, Charlie Brown, I promise I won't pull the football out from under you. Go ahead and kick it. And Charlie Brown runs back, and he's like, are you sure? I promise I won't do it this time. And so he runs back, and he runs toward the football. And sure enough, as soon as he gets there to kick it, Lucy yanks the ball out from in front of him, and he flies and falls on his bottom end. Okay, that's exactly what's been happening with bonds every single year in the state. The, the state convinces people to vote yes on these bonds like it's free manna from heaven, when in fact it's passing on debt to the ch- their children and their children's children. And there's more than one way to enslave a nation, and the debt that our children are going to have to bear, are already bearing, is one, one of those ways. There I got off on a tangent. But that's, it's, that's exactly what's happening. So this was shocking. These were shocking numbers. For me to see it so, so close, it was also surprising for me to see the League of Women Voters opposing this, recommending a no on uh, Prop 1, because they, they generally list pretty hard left. And the last thing I want to say about this Prop 1, obviously we should never you know, support a bond $6.38 billion, billion dollars of the B. Think about that. But what infuriates me as a military veteran myself and someone who really does love and support our military veterans is this idea of using veterans as pawns to sell the bond to the unwitting. The veteran population is actually a very small portion of the homeless population that need these these kind of homeless um, shelters for the mentally unstable. And that's that's what they do. They use them as pawns. And unwitting go, oh, yeah, we should be supporting our veterans. But we did not see them capable of tricking as many people this go around. I think we're starting to see a turn. I really think you're right with that one. I do. And let me just kind of turn our attention real quickly here. I didn't ask you about this the other day, but I think we can do it anyway. The U.S. Senate race uh, with Adam Schiff and Steve Garvey. Now, I supported Eric early during the primaries. Eric and I are friends. Uh, However, uh, Steve Garvey? ended up uh, taking the second place spot here and i have said all along we cannot let adam schiff anywhere near the u.s senate seat and so what are your thoughts on steve garvey and what are your thoughts on november do we think we that steve has enough energy and enough common sense conservatives conservatism within him to somehow cobble together a vote of all the conservatives some independents, and some disaffected Democrats. What say you? It could happen. I think the bigger thing that's kind of surprising that we're not, I haven't heard anybody talk about, is there was a partial Senate race to complete the term from now until the end of the year. He won that. Yeah, I'm looking at the numbers. (laughs) I'm looking at the numbers he did. So he has effectively already taken that seat. He is going to be filling that seat at least through the end of the term. You know, and there's some power in incumbency. Uh, even if you're only an incumbent temporarily, he's still the incumbent. <laughs> so let me ask you a real quick sh- a question on that one, De- Deborah. Uh, sure. we, don't, we only have about a minute and a half here, but maybe we can do it real quick. I'm under the impression that for that partial unexpired term, that's going to go to a special election. In other words, unless Garvey or Shift had 50 plus one, then they would end up taking that seat uh, for the next eight months. Do they go to a special election sometime in April because neither one of them hit 50 plus one? 
I actually do not know the answer to that. Neither question. do I. I wish my, someone would give me an answer. <laughs> uh, you know, I would have to look into it. But I do know this. They'll change the rules to suit themselves. Uh, so even if we think we know what the rules are, uh, they'll, they'll change them and have a different interpretation. My understanding would be whoever wins, wins. Yeah. And that there wouldn't be. Uh, but he would have to fight to retain his seat in November. Um, it's not like a, you know, a, a school board, a county-wide school board or a county board of supervisors where somebody has to get a plurality of the – it's a plurality, yeah. not 50% plus one. Well, so. you know what? From your mouth to God's ears, because that is true. If Garvey ends up winning that unexpired term, there is power in incumbency. Deborah Polly, thank you for joining us today on Politics in the Pulpit. Looking forward to having you back. And uh, hopefully maybe we'll have lunch with a little arugula next time. We'll catch you in just a minute. All right, we're back here for our final segment on politics and the pulpit. This is your holy host, the Bishop of Santa Clarita. Went a little long there with Deborah Polly, but it's always good to talk to her. She's a bundle of information. Uh, Well, we are approaching Palm Sunday. And then, of course, the Holy Week leading up to the resurrection of Jesus Christ on March 31st when we celebrate Easter. And I wanted to quickly just uh, put a quick shameless plug out there for those of you who may or may not have an Easter Sunday service to attend, uh, Freedom's Way Baptist Church. Uh, Love to have you come by on March 31st. 10.30 a.m. is when our main services will start. If you want some uh, little deeper Bible study, 9.15 for Sunday school for all ages. But then 10.30 will be our main worship for Easter Sunday services. There'll be no evening service on that particular day. But uh, we will have a a big Easter Sunday service, so I encourage you to come out if you'd like to. Uh, We'll also have services this Palm Sunday, so uh, 9.15 as usual and 10.30 for the main worship service. And what I'd like to do for the next uh, few moments is just highlight uh, that wonderful passage in the book of Luke talking about Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem and that starts in the book of Luke and in this is a uh, chapter 19 of Luke starting in verse 29 and the Bible says it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives he sent two of his disciples saying go ye into the village over against you in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied whereon never man sat, loose him, and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, Why do you loose him? Thus shall you say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way, and found, even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto him, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed Be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, and glory in the highest. This is the Lord Jesus Christ during his first coming, showing himself to be the lowly lamb that he came for you and I to ultimately die on a rugged cross. The Jewish people were looking for a political ruler. They were looking for a king to whip up on Rome and basically for the Messiah to sit on the throne of David and rule with a rod of iron. And when Jesus didn't, if you will, in their minds at least, match that, uh, ultimately they turned on him, obviously, along with the rest of the known world at the time and crucified him. But here, in this triumphal entry, the king is riding a very humble donkey. But King James, king James says ass, but you know what we're talking about, folks. He's not riding a white steed, as 
we will see him ride in Revelation chapter 19, where the Bible says a sword will proceed out of his mouth. And with that sword, that would be the word of God. He is going to judge the nations. But here he comes as a humble lamb. When he comes the second time, it won't be like a humble lamb. It's going to be like a roaring lion. And my appeal to those of you out there that might be listening that, you know, you like the politics, but you're not too much into the pulpit part of this. My appeal to you going into this Palm Sunday weekend, just ahead of one of the greatest uh, observations of biblical Christianity, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, where he claimed victory over death and the grave, Jesus is giving you a choice. Either accept him as that lowly, meek lamb who was born in a manger and who willfully, voluntarily gave up his life on the cross, took your sins and my sins. The Father, of course, was pleased by that sacrifice. And the only way you and I can have salvation, the only way you and I can have eternal life, the only way we have access to heaven is not based upon our own merit, but based upon his merit. So the choice is yours. Receive him as that lowly lamb, that meek and mild lamb. Or one day you will meet him as a roaring lion. And trust me, you'll want to meet him like that meek and lowly lamb riding into Jerusalem on that very humble donkey where all the people, and this shows you just how fickle people are, folks, those very same people who spread the way with palm branches and shouted Hosanna, King of the Jews, blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, that very same crowd just one week later, many of them would be saying, crucify him, crucify him. It is amazing how the fickle, how fickle people were 2,000 years ago, and frankly, because of our sin nature, things haven't changed at all, folks. People are just as fickle today. And again, I'd encourage you, if you don't have a worship service to attend, our church is traditional, our church is Bible-centered, and we're kind of counterculture. We kind of try to go the opposite way of the world and the trends of the world and if that's something that is kind of up your alley then I encourage you to give Freedom's Way Baptist Church a try we will catch you next week here same bat time same bat channel this is Pastor Cook signaling out here on Politics in the Pulpit on your hometown station